Thank you. I'd like to thank them. Thank you all for having me here tonight, and and thank you all for coming. Um, let me stand over here so I'm not looking into the screen and blocking your view. Um, uh, the prehistoric cultures in this area. <laughs> Got to figure out which way it goes. There you go. The prehistoric cultures in this area uh, are often kind of thought that, well, Native Americans in general are thought as being very simple lives, not very intelligent people. Uh, they were very, very poorly clothed. Uh, you know, man to hunter was the most predominant source of food for them. Uh, and then, you know, they lived in caves and rock shelters. And, uh, you know, in every winter, they're literally crawling on their hands and knees from starvation all winter and eating every little root and whatever they can find to eat off of. And these, they're very biased views on our part. It, anything that, it wasn't as archaic of a life as we tend to think of it as now. And it was actually very elaborate, very rich, very wealthy. And they actually worked fewer hours than we work today and had a lot more goods than we have today. So they don't have computers and fancy high-tech stuff, but they had other things that were just as elaborate and just as important. I want to tell you a little bit about these cultures and the people. Um, if you wanted to look for the earliest people, the first people here in Missouri and around this, what you'd want to look at is the airport or Florissant itself. And that's because 26,000 years ago at the start of the last ice age, um, a large lake formed at that location. So that was all a lake. That's why the soils are so rich here because it's, it's soils bottom, it's river, creek, lake bottom soils. And it attracted a lot of these large megafaunal animals. Mastodons are found all the time in this area whenever they're doing construction and other things. Well about 13, 14,000 years ago people showed up and uh, they started hunting these animals. And you'd think the earliest spear points would be the crudest, and the later ones would be more finely made. Just the opposite. The very first ones are very delicate, very carefully made, well crafted. They put a lot of time and effort into making them very delicate things. And they were extremely good at penetrating the animal's hides and, and killing the, the animals. Um, this is a picture, whenever you go to a museum, this is one of the pictures they always show, something like this, with people standing in the water, uh, killing the mastodons with their spears and, and that, because you know, if you drive a mastodon into muddy waters, he'll get mired down in the mud. Problem with that scenario, if the mastodon's mired down in the mud, you're mired down in the mud when you're out there hunting them. So not a good place to hunt, the way to hunt mastodons, especially a wounded animal that's gonna be thrashing about. That's probably, these, that's probably why these guys aren't gonna be very successful as hunters. Instead though, what people did, they did watch by lakes because they knew that mastodons would come there and, and drink water, just like elephants in Africa today are constantly going to lakes and that kind of places and to get water. And as the herd leaves, they, they would then um, uh, attack the weakest, the last members of the herd. And those are the ones that you find at these kind of sites. So they are near water, but they're not in the water. About uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, the end of the ice age occurred and it became warmer. And you no longer have spruce cedar forest here, but it changes to an oak hickory forest. And the mastodons all die off and they're replaced by deer and elk and, and, and bear and, and other kind of animals. At this transition time, you can see the points are still fairly delicately made, carefully made. What's one of the interesting things though, is that these points are sharpened only on the right side. And then they flip the point over and sharpened only on the right side again, so that it gets this kind of shape over time. And then about 7,900 BC, BCE, they, they change it where they're only sharpening the left side of the point. So you have some people arguing, well that's because um, people at the earlier times were right-handed mostly and the later times they were left-handed mostly. 
No. It was just, per, it was just by them personal choice as which was which. And they preferred the left-handed style versus the right-handed style. Don't know why, why their preference occurred, but it wasn't because one was more right-handed and one was more left-handed. The points start to become a little bit less carefully made, and over time they become cruder and cruder, not better and better. And when we're, they'll just take a point and, and half work it and there'll be bends in it and all kinds of stuff. So they don't become better, but they, become, they do become less times being spent in them. And that's probably because during the Ice Age, the, the, the hunting was the most important source of food at that time. You don't have many plants. You had some plants, but you don't have as many plants as you have later. And so um, they, they're, they're, they're putting a lot of their aesthetic values into killing these animals, as well as their skills into killing these animals. So you do see the spear points as being carefully made, where over time they become cruder. And so here you got people hunting deer. They did use atlatls, a spear thrower, which is the Aztec word for a spear thrower. Uh, they didn't just throw a spear. And the reason is, by using an atlatl, that increases the length of your arm and gives you more of a whipping motion, more force behind it. So the spear will go further and with more power than if you threw it with your hand. And this picture is kind of bad. It's got a lot of things wrong with it. First of all, you don't have to stand that close to a deer to hunt it. You can stand, you know, hundreds of feet away. I mean, you can easily stand from here to the, the end, well, certainly across this room, you'd easily hit a deer. Um, they didn't have long, they, they did use long spears, but they didn't carry four or five long spears with them. Could you imagine carrying four or five long spears in this area through the woods and through the brambles and the briars? You'd get bogged down. Um, they did have dogs when they came here. And, they prob and dogs were ancestors of Siberian wolves. That probably, dogs, people probably didn't tame dogs as much as dog tamed themselves. In that they just liked hanging around people because they could get free food and an easy source of food all the time. And so, but they became a source of mutual beneficial um, by having them around because then they could write, keep off intruders. And you know what intruder people was just deathly afraid of attack coming to them to camp at night? Yes. Possums. Possums and raccoons. They would come in and steal their food. So they weren't worried about bears so much or people so much or even cougars, but they were worried about that. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, you know what? We have saw a police dog, so he must be a mean dog. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So here they are throwing the deer spear points. Now, they would use these on a short foreshaft that would stick into the spear. So when you threw it, and you'd have a whole pouch of these and, and then only one spear. When it hits the deer, the impact causes that long spear point tip, to, uh, a portion of the spear to pounce off and fall on the ground. You run up, pick it up, reload it, it's ready to shoot again. Some people compare it to a prehistoric machine gun. Um, so it's, it works very efficiently. Also, when, you're ready to, when you've killed the deer and you're ready to cut it up, what do you use to cut it up with? One of these, it's a handy dandy knife too. So it's, it's a, a good way of hunting at that time. They've just reintroduced atlatl hunting into Missouri. So if anybody wants to go out atlatl hunting and, and try and catch, get, see their luck with deer, you can do that now. Now, after, during the Ice Age, people were nomadic. They moved around for quite a bit. We can find uh, stones from hundreds of miles away here and stones from here are hundreds of miles away. So you can see these people were nomadic. By, by, by 7,900 BCE, they became now more, more sedentary. But they didn't stay in one spot. They stayed in a territory of maybe, you know, in Alaska it's 100 miles. Around here it probably was 20 miles or so. And then they would stay at one camp during the springtime and get whatever the resources were there and then go to a summer camp where there may be fish and other things that they could hunt there, and then go to a fall camp where they had valuable resources, and then to a winter camp where they can get out of the winter winds, and then back to their original spring camp, and begin what's known as a seasonal round, and begin that round again. And, and 
since you know you weren't going to stay at your camp very long, you didn't build very permanent homes. They did build homes. They, they didn't really live in caves and rock shelters. They built homes. And they were made out of wood. Now the problem we have is, since the homes weren't built too substantial, they leave very little evidence for us to find archaeologically. But you can find the pit features. The fireplaces, the fire horrors that they built. That whenever you build a fire, you burn the ground, you scorch the ground. So even if you built a campfire in your backyard today, archaeologists in the future will know that you had a campfire there. And then the burned wood is carbonized and it preserves. And you can give that to a chemist and they could tell you exactly when that wood was burned using carbon-14. So you can find out quite a bit by looking at these fireplaces alone. Also, if you got this permanent camp, well, oftentimes you would have storage pits. And sometimes you would leave stuff behind. Because why take nut processing tools from a fall camp to a winter camp where you're not going to need them? So what you do is just leave those tools there and then come back and reuse them the following year when you're at that seasonal camp. This is a site where they have all the objects they need for making stone tools right there. Um, sometimes you're lucky and you could even find the food themselves. Here's, this must have been Escar Go Day at this site. We had 3,000 snails that they found and they're all burned. They're, they're actually blue to a reddish color from being in a fire. Um, now caves and rock shelters, if you're, you could use those as a place for storage and that's what they did. Since they knew they were coming back next year, you they did live pits in the ground and covered them over. And oftentimes we often find a big rock by some of these pits that shows you where, where, the, where the pit's at. But um, easier would be to find caves or rock shelters that are nearby. And so they would use those for temporary storage. Uh, ca rock sh caves are good too because they're actually temperate, so they're almost like a little refrigerator. Not, not as, good as, as cold as a refrigerator, but they are cool. And so you could use those. So caves and rock shelters are used more for a temporary basis. If somebody's out hunting or something, they would stay there temporarily. Um, here's one we just did for the Missouri State Parks. Um, they were trying to see if this cave had been looted the heck out of. Everybody's dug there for almost 100 years. So they wanted to know if anything was left there. And uh, we did dig and we did find objects in every pit we dug. So even though it's been looted a long time, there's a lot left still at this cave rock shelter. But you can see how small it is. You know, this is a big one by standards of rock shelters. You're not going to be protected from blowing rains or snows and these kind of things. You know, it'll keep you down from an immediate downpour, but that's about it. You know, so it's good for, for temporary shelter, not for a permanent shelter. You're not living in caves and our rock shelters. They did see these as sacred places, though, and you oftentimes find burials in these locations and sacred objects at these locations. Now, around 6,500 BCE, was what we call the hypsothermal climatic episode. And that was the hot, that became a very hot period. It was actually hotter than it is today and, uh, and drier. So you see, this was where the prairies were at at the time that Europeans first started coming to the Americas. The prairies were expanded at that time. So a lot of the uplands were in prairies or in uh, barrens, which would be uh, forests that were widely scattered. Um, most people tended to start using the river valleys to live. And one of the things they found in the river valleys is that they could fish. So you see fishing becomes an important source of food for them, even more than deer. And waterfowl, ducks, geese, that kind of things, or mussels. In some places you find whole mounds of mussel shells that they've collected over the years and, uh, 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 and eaten them. So you see them starting to rely on water sources and hunting becomes less important at that time. Now they didn't drop it out completely. They certainly had deer steak, but they didn't have it every day. And they didn't care if they had it every day. They had fish every day, but they didn't care if they had deer every day. What they had is were once a week. You know, we don't, we today, we don't even have steak every day, but it's more and more once a week sort of thing or every other week or something like that. And that's what was going on at that time. Hunting, I think, became more important because you could reconnoiter the round of land around you. Um, Another thing is we got this idea that hunting provided most of the food. It did not. Most of the food came from plants. 
especially at this time, nuts. Nuts were the wheat, the corn of the day. And so they gathered nuts. Who got most of the plant foods? The women, not the men. So the women were literally the main breadwinners in those societies at that time, not the men. Um, hunting almost takes on like it is today, more bragging rights. You know, I got the biggest buck or I got the, 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 the biggest uh, 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 fish or the, uh, the uh, bird, that kind of thing. Now, when you're processing nuts, you could take a, a stone and crack it open and eat the nut meat out of it. But it's very time and laborious to do that. It takes a long time to do it. If you need to process lots of nuts, you need a more efficient method to do it. So they develop these nut processing pits. They just dig a little hole about a foot into the ground, uh, take, fill it with water, and then they put a, uh, sometimes they drop a rock in the water to get it heated up. And then on the side, they'd have a stone and they'd put nuts in it and they would crush the nuts and throw the crushed nuts, shells, nut meat and all into the pit. And then what happens is that the nut oils float to the top of that watery solution. And that's what you see, this whitish substance here. The Europeans, when they came here, they thought, where did the, where, and they saw the Indians eating these, drinking these things, they saw, where did they get milk? What are they milking? Are they milking deer? Are they milking buffalo? What are they milking to get this milk? But what it was, was nut, nut oils. And those are very high in fats and proteins. It's the first sports drink that was ever developed. Um, now the nut meats would float in the middle of that watery solution and you take a, a strainer and scoop it out and you could then put it on a stone and grind it up into flour, you could eat it raw, you could mix it with your foods, all kinds of different things. Again, it was the bread of the day, it was the wheat of the day or the corn of the day. The nut shells floated to the bottom of that pit and they would take, uh, scoop those out and use those and you actually find more burned nut shells in their fireplaces than you do wood. So this, this allowed them to process thousands of nuts in a very short period of time. And so from that, they could get enough food for two or three or even a year. And here, here's the nuts. Uh, this is hickory nuts that they processed, even acorns. Now, acorns are, have a problem with them in that they have tannic acids. Tannic acids are poisonous to humans. If you eat a little bit, you can get sick. If you eat enough of them, you could actually die from it. But um, what this did, this nut processing pits, allowed them to process that tannic acids out of the acorn so they could eat those as well. Now, hick, um, um, walnuts, however, did not work as well in the, with this method. They are attached, they got this uh, inner shell, and so it's harder to get those out. So those, they would usually sit and crack those open and eat those like, they like we do nuts during the holiday seasons. I mean, they use a giant hammer to crack mm -hmm. it open. A giant rock to crack it open with. Uh huh. Well, a when, rock hammer. But now, well now, now we use like wooden hammers. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. Now, um, you see this dark soil up here. This is where around 5,000 years ago you start to get these fall gathering part camps, where all these scattered groups that were living in their seasonal round would would move over and join this other big groups of other people, and they would have a big fall party, big fall Oktoberfest. And at that time, um, you, you can tell that this was, spot was continuously occupied in that you have, you can see here you got one pit here and another pit here. When we had to dig this, we had to dig the pits in reverse order that they were left there. So we had to dig the newest pert pit first and then dig the oldest one next. In some places we had 20, 30 pits superimposing because when they came back the following year, they wouldn't know where their, or five years from now, they wouldn't have known where their, their old pits were. And so they would start to superimpose them. So that become fun. That was a fun job because you have to keep those pits separately so that you can see how the people changed over time. So it's very important that we dig the ones that they left last first and then the ones that were the oldest last. Um, but you can get an idea from looking at something like this. You can see a little bit, I don't know if you can tell it or not, but there's a little bit of this one that you can kind of see in this, in this picture. This, so this was the last pit and this was the first pit that was done. Now, they had all the storage pits that they had before. They had these big nut processing pits because there were several people that uh, were, were gathering. And this grinding stone, this, you see that little depression on the top? That's where you put your nuts and then take another stone and crush them up and then throw them into this 
pit filled with water. By the way, this is only half of the pit dug out at this time. This stone was interesting because you flip it over and it's a grinding stone on the other side. So they would grind the, the nuts up for, and get their food from it. Oops. Another thing they developed by 5,000 years ago was earth ovens. They did, not, they did not use fire pits to cook foods off any, as much as they used to. Instead, they started using these earth ovens to cook their foods. And the way these work is you should dig a hole about two to three feet into the ground. You take the white limestone that's in the cliffs around here, heat it till it's red hot, put it down in here, and then take turkey or fish or deer and put them on top of that hot rocks. And then you take more hot rocks and cover, it, cover them over. And then you seal the whole thing over, over with dirt. And we know today that by, it takes just as long to cook a turkey in this oven as it does a modern oven. When we first, we were experimenting with this, uh, first time we did it, uh, some people gave us a couple of squirrels. And we're like, hot rocks. That's gotta take a long time to heat anything of a hot rock. And so what we did, we put squirrels on there and we left them in there mm, about time and a half longer than it would in a, in a modern day oven. Got in there, started looking for the squirrels. We couldn't find them. They were cremated. There was nothing but a powder when they were left. When we used our turkey in there. I guess there was, I guess there was like, I guess there was rock clocks. Yep, yep. <laughs> but when we put the turkey in there, what happened? is that um, we left it, we, we went, didn't want to burn the turkey. And so we left it in a little bit less time than it takes to cook a turkey in a modern day oven. It came out good, it came out nice and juicy and, and ready to eat. Um, it wasn't dried out like it is in modern day turkeys. They would wrap the turkeys in wild grape leaves to keep ash and dirt off of them. And it comes out with a nice fruity taste, nice, uh, 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 good moist turkey. Um, anybody want to do a pit oven for their turkeys? If you go to Hawaiian luau, that's how they roast pigs. Is, is in that fashion. Um, I'm oh, talking about opening up a Joe's Pit poultry place when I when I uh, retire. But um, iron. People don't realize that prehistoric people in this area used iron, and the, especially uh, the softest form of iron, hematite which was used to make a red powder, which they could decorate their skins, their clothing, their houses, all kinds of things. But they also made these things out of iron. Uh, they made iron axes out of iron. They also made these things. And these were net sinkers. They would be used, tied onto nets and used to catch fish with. Now this is the most common method for catching fish, where they would use long nets, and then sometimes they would take, you know, more likely they would take uh, several people, not just two people. And what they would do is that the people would all take a part of the net and then they'd walk out in a line into the water and then they would start to curve back in. And by the time they curved back in, they got all kinds of fish. They got big fish, little fish, blue fish, red fish, sound like Dr. Seuss. Um, and so, and you can, if you get lucky, you can maybe find a turtle or a snake or a frog that you could also eat. Turtles were nice because you could use the, their shells to make a, a, a bowl out of. How would you guys like to eat your cereal out of a turtle shell? <laughs> um, so then you would take the fish and put it over a smoky fire and what that does, that preserves the meat. And so in a very short period of time, these people have all kinds of food for long periods of time. We work, again, like I was saying, we work much harder in our society to make a living today than prehistoric people did. They had much more leisure time than we do today. Uh, these fall gathering spots, you can see some interesting things. This one was a huge stone that was over six by six feet. The nearest source of this stone was a quarter of a mile away. So you would ha they had to carry this a quarter of a mile to this location. And I suspect that they had it setting up. We found at least five other large stones that were brought here. So I think these fall gathering spots were not only a place to do joint hunting, joint gathering places, but were also places to do ceremonial objects, uh, activities, which would then bring the whole, all these groups together as a cohesive unit to bring them all together. Um, this is how we moved the stone to see if there was anything buried under it or not, but uh, we had a little extra help. Uh, we weren't about to try and carry these things. Um, but one of the problems that hunters and gatherers have is that what do you do when, you, when your territory starts to run out of food? Well, hunting is a way to look for new resources. While you're out hunting, you're 
chasing game, but you're also noticing, hey, there's a bunch of nut trees over there, or hey, there's a nice source of chert that we can use for making stone tools over there. And so that was more important than actually the hunting and bringing back the meat at these times. Also, certain groups also would have their, uh, as a rites of passage, they'd send their children off to explore new territories and new lands so that they could find new places to go to. Um, or you would, uh, these, these fall gathering spots were also nice because they became a place where you could exchange information. You'd find out the latest nut, nut processing pits or you found out the latest tools that were being used. And also another benefit of these places, you can marry your sons and daughters off. All hunting and gathering societies that we know of know that it's not good to marry within your group. You get, we know of it now, it's genetic problems that developed, but they wouldn't have known it was genetic. They knew it was bad. And so they all, hunting and gathering societies we know across the world, had taboos against marrying within your group. And so oftentimes you couldn't even marry the adjacent group, but you had to marry a distant group. And what these fall gatherings was a place to, to get young people can meet their new mates and marry off and go live with them. And so what happens at times of, of you start to fight with your neighbors or the food starts to give out or you just get tired of living here, what you do, you pick up and move in with your in-laws. So some things don't change even to this day. So, um, but it's a way of dispelling fighting and, 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 and warfares was by doing that. Now, we did find some burials that were in, in this area, and you can see where they buried it, usually just outside where the camps were at one time, but over you know, however many years that they kept returning to this, they'd forget where the burials were at. They didn't mark them or anything, and so you see that a lot of the burials have a hole from a later pit dug into them, like this one has a hole right where the head was at. But what's interesting, they didn't say, oh my gosh, I ran into a head and they just picked up the bones and tossed it into a, another pit uh, to get rid of it. And they kept, went ahead and used that pit. So you see for this group at this time, they thought once your body was gone, it's gone. You don't have to worry about the bones. You don't have to protect them anymore. There was one group of people that were interesting though. Was this, this is a group of four individuals we found here. Um, there are three adults and one child. The child is right in the middle here, um, right there. And when we were digging the child, we found a spear in his back. And so we sent it off to a the, the bones and everything to a forensic anthropologist. And when he looked at it, he says, not only was the spear stuck in the child's back, but it was twisted and the spear tip broke off. So there's clear cut evidence of murder, warfare, something going on at this site. And you notice too, the people are missing their heads and most of their arms and legs. So here we do have clear cut evidence that it wasn't all congenial at this camp, that it did become to be a fighting. Um, I'm wondering if it's one of the last episodes here. We did find uh, two legs laying on top of the ground, well, what would have been ground surface at that time, that was just laying there from the knees down to the toes. So we know that it wasn't carried there or placed there. It was stuff that was, that was intact and was left. So it may have been a last, one of the last times I used this camp. About 4,000 years ago, they start to get bigger villages. And some of these appear to start to be permanent villages. Uh, this is the Hayden site, which is in Chesterfield. It's named for Hayden Holmes, who was, whose property was developing this. Um, and uh, w w you've got all these pits, you know, a lot of earth ovens, uh, fire pits, and uh, big, huge storage pits, big, huge storage pits in this place. But outside of this area where the red is, was where they were processing chert. Um, Burlington, when the, when, the, when the creek, right here is Bonham Creek, and it cut into the ridge here. When it cut into a ridge, it exposed a bed of Burlington chert. Burlington chert is like glass. It's very easy to work, and you can make extremely sharp tools out of it. In fact, tools that are sharper than any metal object we have today. Now there's one reason why we don't use stone tools. Even though they're sharper than any metal object, the problem with stone tools is they go dull faster. And so they don't last as long. And so that's why people preferred metal when that started being introduced. You didn't have to remake a stone tool or resharpen it as much. Um, the, the one good thing about that though is that it leaves a distinctive wear pattern. So you can tell when something's used for cutting, cutting ch plants, cutting trees, cutting uh, uh, meat, whatever, you can tell. Um, now, 
these, you know, you got all this chert laying here. This one's kind of interesting is that you had a pit right here. Then you had a blank that was filled with chipping debris when they were knocking off chips to make their stone tools. Right here, you had a blank, whoops, you had a blank space where the person was sitting. And then around them, you have these large pieces of stones and broken pieces of tools that were being worked on. And even a complete at a complete point right there that they laid in the grass, probably made 10 or 20 of them, laid it in the grass and forgot to pick up that one. Um, so you can see that there and there's another one there. So this is clear cut evidence of how uh, of somebody sitting here napping and making stone tools. We found hundreds and hundreds of blanks, complete blanks, and over 300 complete spear points at this location. If, if we had been another time, we'd been, we'd been, people, people have found these kind of things and said they were Indian battlefields and there was a great battles here. Well, this wasn't a battlefield point, this was an industry. They were making stone tools for trade. And what's interesting about this time is how, whoops, is how big the, the spear points are. They're extremely long. I refer to this sort of as the 1970s cars that we had at that time where we had these big uh, LTDs and big cars. This was sort of the same thing where everybody had this big luxurious looking spear point and it was very showy. And so they would trade these things all over the United States and somebody, somebody else would be looking at that and say, wow, nice point you got there, Charlie. Where'd you get that from? So they became a very standard and widely traded. You see trading going on at this time and where f copper from the Great Lakes is traded down into this area. Um, uh, le t a lead from Missouri was found in L Louisiana at this time. Um, spear points from this area are all over the place. Especially this, because most people didn't have really good chirts. One of the things that's interesting during this trading period though, even though they knew about metal working, and up in the Great Lakes area, they made stone or metal axes and tools and all kinds of things. Nobody wanted those. Everybody wanted the metal ornaments, the metal jewelry. They didn't want the metal tools. Just the opposite happened in Europe and China and places where everybody wanted the metal tools and they thought that was great. Nobody around here wanted those. And it probably was because there was enough different types of chert resources that they could rely on those and didn't have to worry about metal tools. It would have been a real interesting story if they had made, because some of the metal working they were doing in the United States, especially in South America, was far exceeded any kind of metal working they were doing in Europe at the time. But uh, they were more interested in ornaments. And so it could have been a whole different story when the uh, Amer uh, uh, Europeans came over here. <coughs> um, oh, one of the interesting things, one of the things we found traded at this site were these things. Spear points. Why would you want, if you got hundreds of spear points, why do you want more spear points? But look at their colors, they're different colors. So that would be showy and that you've got this broad expense. It was this big showy stuff like this that made people start to settle down at these places year round. This is just showing where the site's at and where the Burlington shirt's exposed at the surface. So you can see most of them were placed where the Burlington shirt are very near it. Now the trading stops about 3,000 years ago. And we don't know why, but at that time, they started to live in cities, in permanent towns, permanent communities. And we have evidence of permanent homes. And here's one of the homes, whoops, whoa, what happened there? Okay, here's one of the evidence of the permanent homes right here. All of these holes were not for posts, those were storage pits. Now they didn't have all of those storage pits using all those at one time. They'd have no place to sit and, and do anything. Instead, they probably only had one or two of these open at a time. And then as they got old or smelly or infested by mice or whatever, they then filled them in and dug a new t another couple of pits. So over time, you get all of these that were built up over the old look. So that tells you you've got a permanent uh, site there. And then, um, Here's what the house would have looked like. It's basically the roof above you and then you're living down in here just below that. The roof, the poles were placed in the back dirt piles which were placed outside of here. So when later floods came, they washed away where those poles were at. So it's not really evident where the poles sat at this location. Um, but this is very energy efficient home. You stay perfectly warm in these houses. Um, at this time, their this is one of their burials. 
where they're marking with stones. At this time, you want to protect the graves. You don't want to, you don't want to harm them in any way. And so you'd see they would put goods with these people and they would cover them with stones so that you wouldn't inadvertently dig into them in the future. 2,000 years ago, you see the wealthy starting to be buried in mounds. There's some evidence that even during that time period before, they started using mounds for, for the elite members of the society. Oh, by the way, one of the things we've learned, we always thought that in order to get permanent settlements, what happened was is that people's population got too big or they started running out of food. And then that forced them to go to farming to get enough food. And since they were farmers, they had to live in a city or a permanent settlement so that they could get their food and grow their food. And then, you, since you're living in a permanent spot, you need to trade. Not what's happening in the United States, just the opposite. The economy was booming at the time they came here. They were doing great as being hunters and gatherers of all those fancy techniques that they developed. But they did start to want to trade. And so you see trading was actually the, the motivation. With trading coming in, you did have people like the Bur that Hayden site where people wanted to settle down year round so they could take advantage of that trade. And then as they were sitting down, they started experimenting, playing with growing crops. They didn't turn to growing crops right away. They just experimented with it. Um, but they still didn't become full-fledged farmers. They were still predominantly hunters and gatherers. And uh, so it looks like it's totally reverse of what we always thought. Um, and then um, by this time, they are living in permanent settlements, big villages. You have some of these big villages that develop into very large market centers where you have the leaders of these communities gaining a lot of power and a lot of prestige. And they're trading for goods all over North America and getting all kinds of fabulous things. Uh, Here's some of the goods, you know, you're getting copper from the Great Lakes, uh, marine shell beads from the Gulf of Mexico. Also at this time, 2,000 years ago, they start using pottery year round. And it comes introduced. And the pottery is very ornate, very decorative. You even get these kinds of things where they're putting, the spoonbill duck was a real common effigy that you see on their pots. And it, it was just like the G Greeks uh, did put their heroes on plates this and, and, and vessels. This was the same thing. This is one of their mythological figures that they're putting on this. Unfortunately, the story's been lost to time, so we're not certain what it was. You also find these things which are called Casper the Ghost images. They look like ghostly images. Now they could just be dowels and that's it. They may be Kachina dowels like you get in the Southwest which re reflected spirits. And so, uh, or it could be another possibility is that it's the images of their dead ancestors. You do see that they did have ancestor worship at this time. And they would go back to places where they're dead and have big feasts and that kind of stuff. Or by large mounds, you see big feasts going on from time to time. Um, you got this fancy pottery and then about um, uh, a little bit over uh, 1700 years ago, all of a sudden, boom, you go from this really fancy pots to just cord marked plain vessels. They're conical shaped. And you're like, why would you make a cone shaped vessel? That would be hard to stand up. But if you're heating foods, one thing nice about it is that you've got an even distribution of heat. So it's like cooking in a Chinese wok versus a pan that we have in most of our homes today, where a pan just sits there flat and everything burns on the bottom and you gotta constantly stir it. This the distribution of heats across the whole thing, so it's a lot more efficient use of the heat. So you don't have to stir the foods as much and it gets better and more of it gets heated up. At this time, you do see they were for the first time, they were full-fledged farmers. So farming came in almost a, th a thousand years after uh, they went to permanent villages. Now farming, um, th everybody knows about corn. These people knew about corn. During that 2,000 year ago period when they were trading all over, they did introduce corn as an exotic food from, the Gulf of, from Mexico. But it was looked on as just an exotic food. It wasn't considered an important food. So they, don't, they didn't grow corn. Instead, what they grew were lamb's quarter, knotweed, maygrass, and little barley. These are plants that grow around all of your homes today as weeds. And around here, these, these lamb's quarter are huge. 
they can grow really big here in Florissant. Um, but, uh, and what they did, they, they, the, the prehistorically, they altered the seed so that it has a thinner seed coat and more seed in it so that you could eat it more efficiently. And so they, they became dependent on humans with a thinner seed coat. The seed would germinate too soon if it was left on its own, so it would germinate when people planted it. So the top two would, could grow, were harvested in the, winter, in the fall. The bottom two were harvested in the spring. So you had food year round. It turns out uh, we, we're growing it today. It's quinoa. We now know that it's a superfood. It's not just a, a food that you can eat, but it's a superfood. It has all the amino acids your body needs. It's one of the best foods you can eat for, for you. Um, it was introduced as a health food from Peru, where they continue to make this food. And it was just looked at as, oh, we, we can use it for your digestive system. You know, it's good for that. But pretty soon they started introducing, they found out that it's, hey, you can use it for more than just food, or just more than just health foods. And so now, I think we're only just beginning, because you could use it like rice, you can do all kinds of things in it. And the one thing nice about these plants, you don't have to fertilize them and pamper them and baby them like you do corn and soybeans, which are not native to this area. We've had to kind of alter to make them sort of native. But, and they will grow in any urban lot. You could go around this building and plant a crop of these things and they would come up good. Especially here. They would come up really good, let me tell you. Um, and so, uh, it, it, you, could, you could easily uh, reintroduce this into our food system. I've been arguing for years that we should be eating these foods instead of corn and that. And it's interesting, it's been reintroduced. Oh, you can actually turn these into ethanol too. So I could sell or some of our energy crisis as well. At this time, they also st started introducing the bow and arrow. Um, this period's looked as sort of a dark age because the large-scale trading is stopped. People are no longer living in big communities. They're living in small villages, small farming villages. Farming allowed them to be independent from the big, uh, big men, the, the, the big leaders that were, they've had to follow before. And one of the, another interesting thing about this time period is that right here on this upper site, you get um, all of their homes are placed right next to each other. And then all their cooking pits are placed next to each other. And then down here was the burial ground for these people. So you can see, instead of, some people consider this sort of a dark age, which is interesting because it occurs at the same time as the dark ages in Europe. So you have people arguing, is there some kind of global thing that's causing this? But I see it as just more of a social experimentation. They got fed up with these big leaders telling them what to do and where to go and what to do, and they sort of went hippie. They became hippies, they started their own communes, they became, uh, tried socialism and communism all this during this time. They experimented, they didn't call them that, but that's in essence what they were experimenting with. And you know, the leaders are at this time are buried not with elaborate goods, but with very simple things to show that they were not elaborate and they weren't better than the people. And people did communal cookings and lived next to each other. Now, about 900 CE, you get a change going on where you still get these big communities, though they actually the big, big communities actually become even larger. But now instead of everybody living together, they're now spreading out into individual f uh, neighborhoods within this community. So you can see all these individual neighborhoods in this one. And um, each one of the communities are marked by a big post that's placed in it. This one, actually was only half of the community. It would have come around here and um, been sort of this large open donut shaped village where they were living. And so you'd have, and you'd had then these sub communities within that. Corn does become more important in the diet. However, lamb's quarter, may grass, knotweed, little barley are still the predominant crops. And that's true through to route prehistory, the, till, the, till the end of prehistory. Sp arrowheads become even smaller. By this time, they're so small, collectors call these bird points because they thought they were only big enough to kill a bird. But these things are big enough to kill a bear or a deer or a person. Um, 
one of the things we found at this Gateway Academy site is that we had these three pots. We got one there and then two there that were complete. And we started removing the pieces and there's human bones inside of it, cremated human bones. One of the interesting things from this time period, you don't find many burials. And I think that they were cremating them. And it's sure enough, a few years later, we were digging a site nearby, the Lawless site, and we found, oops, these big pits in the ground. Um, you can see they're very deep pits and look how red they are, heavily burned. This is another one of them. You see how heavily burned it is. These are the cremation pits where they're, where they're burning the bodies and then giving it to placing them in pots and then they're burying it near their house or keeping it in their house or burying it near their houses. So that good old Uncle Charlie could still be around. If you have any trouble, you can still go to good old Uncle Charlie and ask him for advice and things. But, and you see a lot of grave goods that were laying around, oops, at this location. Um, this, whoop, oh. <laughs> My hands are too big for this thing. <laughs> what you got is a big post right there. Oops. You got a big post right here. And then next to it was a, a bowl filled with maygrass seeds. So they left that as a, a um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, uh, I kept wanting to say trophy. It's like, no, it's not a trophy. Uh, yeah, for ceremonial. Uh, this, uh, um, now, a little bit later in this time, you start to see where they're then smoothing off the tops of those conical shaped cord marked vessels and even putting a red paint at the top of some of these. They're also putting in lug, loop handles and lugs with sometimes effigies of animals and that kind of things on them. This is a little uh, uh, fox or dog. And then here you got a, even made effigies like this. This owl effigy is interesting in that one eye is higher than the other and the nose is bent in sort of an S shape. And we saw several of these and we're like, boy, what's going on? They're so good at making things. Why are they messing up so much on this owl? Well, it turns out we found there was a story still being told by Native American groups of a cockeyed owl that plays tricks on human beings. So this is an old trickster owl, owl that was there. And the story goes back a thousand years. Um, you also find these stumpware lodge objects. They look like tree stumps with roots at the bottom of them. But, and everybody always thought this is how they were displayed. They thought they were chalices or uh, 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 pedestals and where you can grind up stuff. I'm starting to lose my, uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> and instead, they're, they're probably done like this and they're used for holding pots. <laughs> And I, this, what I think they put these over was fireplaces because you oftentimes find these are poorly made and they're often heavily burned and they have holes in them and the holes have burned material in there. So I think what they did, they used sticks to move these around within the fireplaces and that's how the charred material got into these pots. So I think this depiction is probably pretty accurate, but it's still the, the still out in terms of how those were used. Projector points again, you know, the arrowheads. Um, you start to see agriculture and deep storage pieces Hits. What's interesting, and then these deep earth homes, they were, most of their homes were built deeply into the ground. There you can see where the posts were, and this is what one of them would have looked like. So just a roof above ground. These homes were very energy efficient. You stayed perfectly cool during the summertime and perfectly warm during wintertime in these things. You didn't need much of a fire in there. In fact, you wouldn't want much of a fire in these things. One spark and there goes your whole house. But you see these people, all of these things were sort of leading up to the Mississippian period. This is sort of known as a transitional period, emergent Mississippian period, but it's been leading into this Mississippian period. And then boom, it goes crazy during Mississippian times where trading's going on all over the place. They build mounds for their leaders' houses, um, um, all kinds of different things. You get a wide range of communities, including um, several large market centers, which is where those red dots are at. I um, mean, you had everything from a market centers to um, single homes that were out there. They had single farms just like we did in a store, like we do today, where people were going. So the economy was doing so good they could actually have single family homes at that time. Um, this is the Bridgeton site. And uh, one of the things about it is that most of the pottery wasn't made in the Mississippian style, which is what, whoops, which is what this is here, but it's made in the old uh, 
transitional period style with the cord marked and then the conical shaped and that. Um, this is the type of this angled vesseled uh, jars were introduced during the Mississippian periods. So that most of them were, they were still using the old style jars at this. And then they would build trenches and then put the walls of their houses in the trenches. And they didn't dig them down as deeply as they did the time before. Um, this is one of the trenches, here, one of the big houses here, where the walls have been rebuilt four to five times. The whole floor was covered in mica, a silvery substance. The whole floor was scattered with this mica. So when the sunlight uh, shone in it, or when the fire was lit in it, it sparkled with all this mica on the ground there. And even some pieces of copper turned up here. And uh, uh, two uh, whelk shells that turned up. And you see whelk shells are becoming very popular as talismans and that kind of thing. Um, from this site, during the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the sun appears to rise right out of this portion of the Missouri River Bluff. Right at that location, they found where that building's at, they found 20 skulls where people were buried. Another time, they found a person standing up, buried facing the river, who was standing up at his feet were all these arrow points. And then another spot, they found six graves of people which had whelk shells placed over their faces. So you can see this was a very sacred spot to them. And then during the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, that sun appears to rise at that point. Um, and this is what the bridge decided if we could have dug the whole thing. And unfortunately, that's all been destroyed now by, by an industrial court. But if we could have dug it, we would have found something like this, which was a, a, another site we had dug, where it would have been sort of in this circular shape, where you have the working people over here and then the leaders' homes over here. And it's interesting at this site <clears throat> in that there's a, a drainage, a small drainage right here. And the soils, this soil up here is really sandy. It drains really well. As you go over here, especially for these back houses, it becomes very clay and wet. So it's almost like they had this idea in their mind. They're going to make this this size, and that's how it's going to be. And that's where they're going to put these houses. And it doesn't matter whether there's a drainage there or not. We're going to build it right there. Either that or they're making these poorer people punished. But uh, not all the people were in that drainage, but a good number of them were. So, and then you had this big open plaza area where they had ceremonies, events, and that kind of thing going on. St. Louis had a mound group as well. It had 26 mounds, which are just north of the arch. In the 1830s, people said, wow, this is great. This is fabulous. Why don't you build a monument to your past here? You know, this would be, you can put in gardens and walking paths and places where people can sit and talk and it'd be a great thing to do. Well, no, the city was more developed into tearing down all these and putting in tenements, which were jammed, filled with Irish tenements and, Ger and German immigrants and, uh, and uh, really and destroyed all these mounds. And then in the 1950s, we decided, hey, we need a monument to our past in Missouri. So, hey, let's build an arch. So they ended up doing what people in Europe said they did. They just didn't keep the mound, which is a shame because Cahokia Mound, which is across the, in Illinois, is a World Heritage Site. People come from all over the world to come to see that spot. They could have been coming here to St. Louis to see that. You know, the arch is kind of made up for it a little bit. Um, but there's only one mound still known in St. Louis, and that's Sugarloaf Mound. And the, the people that own this house recently moved, and so the, the only people that were interested in taking it was the Osage. And fortunately, the Osage Nation has bought this property, and they're going to tear down the house and preserve the mound. The Dampier site. In the middle of Chesterfield Valley, you've got all these and, uh, uh, stores, every kind of restaurant you can name. Uh, not one, but two retail malls. They couldn't decide which retail mall to go with, so they said, okay, build them both. Um, and you got every kind of store and everything down in this, down in this valley. Well, right at the edge of it, when they were putting, uh, built, digging for the uh, levee to protect this from a flood, they ended up hitting a prehistoric a civic ceremonial center, just like Cahokia there. Now, they were supposed to do something with this middle part, but overlooked it. So they did, the Army Corps demanded that we come in and look at the edges of this to see what wasn't destroyed. And it turned out to be an incredible, fortunately, I think we're right in the heart of this city. 
One of the things we found were these square houses. Now, square ho most houses are rectangular, so it's kind of strange to have these square houses. And then all these pits inside of houses. Most pits are outside a house, not inside, because you don't want to take up your, your floor space with that. But I think what these are is, this, is the shopping center. This was the market center. And one of these houses, we found 37 shell beads, both marine shell beads and even some local deer, shell, deer teeth beads. Uh, another one, we found um, oops, this uh, copper or this a vertebra, a deer vertebra that was made in the shape of a snake with a pointed uh, uh, point-like tail at the end of it. Um, and you can see the snake-like skin on top of it. Notice the color of that bone. It's green. It's green because it was covered in copper at one time. So I don't know if they use this as a tin plate and they put these things on here and then made the image of this, uh, this being on the copper or exactly what it was, or if it was just a copper covered ornament. But it, what's going on is that most of the goods would have been displayed outside. But the shopkeeper evidently stored most of the goods inside. So instead of having a little temporary house like this, they had an actual building there. And they stored most of their goods in storage pits or even shelving. We got evidence of shelving on these things inside of it. And you can see where they were living and had cooking pits inside of this. So they would live inside there, get out of the rain inside these buildings, and then come out and display all their objects outside of it for people to buy or to purchase. We also have an L-shaped temple. Um, you got this little area here that uh, segregates this portion of it from this other area. Uh, from this little small pit here, we got uh, a number of shell beads in front of it. And then we, we know the doorways right here. And then there was a large post just inside the door. Now the door, the post isn't in a central spot, so it wasn't holding up a roof. And then next to it was this offering pit that was filled with fish bones. So we're like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So what I think's going on with this, when you enter this building from the bright sunlight coming into this dark building, the first thing staring you in the face was an image of a god. So you knew that you were in a sacred spot. Now, we had another L-shaped building that turned up. Right, technically we were supposed to stop here, but the city was building a sewage treatment facility down here and they needed a road to it. And so the Army Corps guy said, you're going for it. We're digging this out. And so we, even though we had just this little edge of this thing exposed at the edge of the trench, he said, go for it. So we got a chance to look at it and it turned out to be another L-shaped thing. We we're like, great, we got two temples. This is even better. Turned out it's not a temple. It was feasting pits, big feasting pits. This one, he, this large one here, you can see where the ground is sloped, where people entered in, out, in and out of this pit all the time. And then you have a whole series of posts that were right in front of it. I'm sure there was images of gods or spirits and that kind of thing in it. Um, inside these feasting pits, all kinds of burned animal remains, uh, large pieces of limestone where they were cooking them with, um, huge animals, big catfish, uh, uh, um, sturgeon, uh, uh, even trumpeter swine, swan and uh, uh, big geese turned up here. Um, a big uh, deer, even lots of elk, and I, maybe even buffalo. We found some bone, I swear it was an oxen. It was so big, so it had to be, it could have been a big elk, but it may have been a buffalo. We haven't had all the art of objects looked at from this. We did look at a sample of them. One of the interesting things, we also found these birds. Now, you can't eat the meat off these birds. There's just not much there. But look at their feathers. They're very colorful. Then we found this object. It's a bird bone with a piece of copper rolled in the inside of the bone. Bird bones are hollow, so, and what they did was roll this copper and stick it on the inside. And we're like, what's up with that? Well, what it is, is part of a headdress. So what you have is the copper would be glinting out of the top and the bottom of the headdress, and you could stick your feathers into that copper to hold it in place. So they were sacrificing important objects at this location. Then we found this object, which is interesting. This is a game of, of Chunky, which was the baseball of the day. Everybody had a chunky field right in front of the big chief's house. And every, it, just like St. Louis, where you got it right downtown St. Louis, it was the same thing there. And they all played it. And the way you play the game is one person rolls a spear on the ground, and then 
uh, two people would roll these chunky stones and whose spear, whose ever chunky stone fell over next to the spear was the winner of the game. They would bet, they would play this game for hours. It was the most popular game throughout Eastern Missouri or Eastern United States at that time. One of the interesting things about this chunky stone, it's got a crinoid fossil. In it. it was made out of limestone and there's a crinoid fossil there. So when you roll this on the ground, it would wobble. The chief knew it would wobble and knew how it would wobble and which way it would go. So he had basically loaded dice he was playing with when he was doing this. We also found these objects, which are um, long-nosed God's objects. Only 20 of these have been found in the country. We found three of them. Four pieces, the three individual ones. The long-nosed portion of it, I think, was made out of copper. These are made out of seashells, but I think the long-nosed portion was made out of copper. It's interesting, it's broken in fours, which is a very sacred um, number and, and way of, of, of doing it to them. Um, but this is the one that was found in the St. Louis Mound Group. And you can see it's, it's a human head with a long bird-like beak. So it's part bird and part, part human. And it's based on a story of, the, of Longhorn, uh, who's this guy with a long red hair with a long braided hair. And he had these human-like faces like these that would wink at when they were playing Chunky. They were fighting against Titans, just like the Greeks believed in Titans, giants that they had to constantly fight against. And they would play Chunky against them. So while they were playing, this human head on his ears would wink and, and do different things to get to distract the Titans so they would lose. So they lost and lost and lost. Eventually the Titans won and they dismembered Longhorn and as, as other members and what his sons did they had avenged his father's death and resurrected his resurrected his body pulled his body back together and resurrected it very similar to the Egyptian Osiris story so what you see is you see similarities between the Greeks and the Egyptians with this but what they're doing what this is reflecting is their idea of life and death where you live you die you go to a dark underworld and then you're reborn into this world so that is why you see with the Native Americans of this area, uh, hundreds of, uh, or of, of shell beads, whelk shells, because all these beads are coming from, the whelk shells are coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Copper, which is coming from the Great Lakes. Um, the pot pottery is more fancy at this site than at the farm sites. And that's because these people weren't as concerned about daily living and, 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 and eating as they were about fancy. So they had the fancy pots. So it'd be like being living at the wife's house. You wouldn't be eating off regular plates and, and stuff. You'd be eating off fancy stuff. And then these pots, you know, that you see at the other sites just don't exist at this location. Um, you got uh, all kinds of, of really ornate decorative pieces. Uh, a deer, you don't see too many deers, and that's what's interesting. This site had a deer heads, and this wood, uh, wood duck that turned up that's made just like a real wood duck. There's a real one, so you can see it imitates it in many ways. And then you have this big, what turned out to be an U-shaped building. And it's from the temple, during the, the spring and fall equinox, the, whoops, the, uh, um, the uh, 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 spring and fall, the first day of spring and fall, the sun appeared to rise out of the mouth of that charnel house. That's where the leaders were buried inside of that building. And so you can see that was a very sacred spot and it's interesting, the open end of it, the sun would appear to rise right out of it. And then you got the same thing at where this large mound is at. During the winter solstice, the sun appears to rise right out of this mouth of this thing. It's interesting, we thought that there was always a, a looter's trench dug in the center of it. I'm thinking now that it was purposely made this way so it looks like a frog or a snake's mouth open and the sun would rise out of it on the shortest day of the year. Also notice what's below it, caves. We're starting to see now that mounds were often take place next to caves, large springs, large rock shelters. They were, again, these were looked on as portals to the underworld, the world of the dead. But what's strange, about, seven, about 700 years ago, all this ends. They no longer are doing trading all over the place. They're no longer have living in big zip cities. 
One of the real mysteries is they don't even live here anymore. What they're doing, you have tribes like the Sioux from North Dakota coming down here and hunting and trapping and gathering mineral resources from this area. Uh, the Illini tribes coming in, the Fox and the Sock coming in. All these tribes would come here, live for a short period of time, gather the resources, and then they would move back to their villages. Nobody was living here, and it's a real mystery why this area was abandoned until the coming of the French. That's why the French had such an easy time moving into this area initially. So it's a real mystery why um, it was abandoned and what happened to the people. And so that's one of the things, you know, we can hopefully learn from. But, um, and then real briefly, this is what happens to most sites. Uh, this was where one of those rock uh, graves were at that dated 4,000 years ago, even though it was known. Well, the way the United States, Missouri's law reads is that even though if you know if it's a burial ground, it's up to the developer to stop when they hit burials, even if it's a known burial ground in the past. And so the developer will do the right thing and stop. Didn't stop. Nobody stops. Every, every village we dig, we find graves in it. Never a grave has been found up by developers. And then here's a big uh, house we were working on, and somebody came in the middle of the night and took out a backhoe and dug out, trying to find pottery and that kind of stuff. So it's a real shame because it, we're losing so much about our past. You know, it's, it's not how much money you can make off these objects, but it's what these objects tell us about people and us today that we can learn from that's so important. Um, this is where that permanent village that was 3,000 years old that we first, the first permanent village that was found in Missouri. And MoDOT actually opened this up to school children. Now this is the school of the death right there that came out and visited one day. We had a great guy from Germany who altered his trip from Germany to this little small town to look at this site because he heard about it. And he says, wow, the houses were amazing because they were bigger than the ones in Germany at the same time. So it's, it's, um, it's one of those things. The archaeology can bring in tourism. It can help developers, you know, by bringing in tourism and tourism dollars. It can help the community. It brings a source of community pride. And who knows what source of new food, what medicines, what cure for cancer we're losing now because we're, we're not paying attention to this past. So that's why we do archaeology in this area and why we hopefully learn from these prehistoric groups. Okay. Oops. Now it doesn't want to move. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, thank you all then. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. You can use it, and it is beneficial, but you got to watch it. It's not. It's sort of like carbon-14. Everybody thinks carbon-14 is 100% accurate and it'll tell you everything. No. Uh, same problem with ground-penetrating radar. It's not as accurate as we come to believe it. For instance, this site, they did ground-penetrating radar here and said, there's nothing there. Go ahead and do your development. Fortunately, the archaeologist says, well, let's ground-proof that. And it turned out to be big houses that the ground penetrating radar did not pick up. Because it went from this real dense clay from the flooding episodes in recent time to a, a sand, and the ground penetrating radar couldn't pick up that subtle differences. So it's not as, as we like our technology and we think it's always 100%, but it's, it's got problems with it. And that's why you do th more, you have to do more. Mm -hmm. On the pot that had the very abstract uh, part or picture of the dust, mm -hmm. Is there a reason why it was so abstracted? Because obviously they, they knew it wasn't right. representative. Right, figure. right. It may be because it was representing a spirit, so you don't want to draw it accurately, in a sense. So it's, it's so you depict it with a little, uh, it, it, it was stylized version of it, in essence. So that may be why it's always depicted that way. Mm -hmm. And everybody would know the story. So you didn't really have to make it 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. But certainly at other times, they did depict ducks very accurately in does and other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh-huh. What year was the Chesterfield Valley site excavated? Uh, 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh. What year did the uh, mounds 
show up in St. Louis? The first mounds are probably about 4,000 years ago. But they really start showing up about 2,000 years ago is when you start getting the biggest ones. But about 3,000 years, 4,000 years ago, rather, they started, when they started doing those permanent villages for the first time, you see then the leaders taking on special importance, and you start to see mounds at that time. Oh, yes. Okay, so when did they, when you're talking about that they... Stop making mounds? You no. Know, oh. That they, I guess, destroy them. Oh, them. after the French time. So most of them are in the 1860s, mid-1800s until today. You know, certainly as soon as the Europeans started coming here, they were into and Americans, they were interested in looking at them because they thought the mounds were built by another culture because the Indians were not smart enough to build the mounds. Well, this is the first time I've heard. Yeah. Like, yes. Yes. The first time yeah, it's yeah, and it's when just they Yeah, they went in the 1860s when they went. Mhm. Mm 18 yeah. And so yeah, but they always thought that they were made by somebody from Europe, from Africa, from someplace else that they weren't built by the Native Americans. They considered them not being intelligent enough. Thomas Jefferson did. He kind of fought for them. And it wasn't only until 1890, 1900 that people fully accepted it. But what happened by that time? We had uh, decimated almost all the Native American troops, and they were forced, or Native American people, and they were forced on reservations. So now we could think of them nostalgically, and now, for the first time, people could accept that they did build these things. But you'll still see it come up that some other from uh, outer space or someplace else that built these things, and it's not true. So by about 1300, then, these societies, you really don't find any evidence of them anymore? Around in this area from 1400 on, no evidence of them at all. We have not found one site dating to them. Now, out in western Missouri, they have found some sites yeah. dating to this transitional period. The Osage, for instance, start moving into western Missouri about 1400. But no evidence of people living here. And from everything the French gathered, it was just an open territory. When people tried to set, because some people tried to move here with the French, and they got attacked right and left, because all these other groups wanted it. Why they died off or left or whatever. Mm -hmm. I saw something recently on National Geographic. There was a program on TV about a major volcanic eruption. Right. And, and we don't. No, see no that evidence of that. Sort of thing. No evidence of that. Because if it was, if that it happened, caused, it caused people to right. die off in Europe. But then people in Western Missouri wouldn't exist then either. Yeah. But they're yeah, here. I think, I think what it was was a Viking time in essence. It was a instead of of trying to outcompete each other, some communities thought they would just raid and just come in here and raid places. So St. Louis area was always at a beneficial for throughout prehistory because it was at the crossroads of all these rivers. So it was easy to come here and get resources and bring in new ideas and everything. But it made it open to raiding. And I think that's what happened. It became a, it's almost, almost the same thing at the Roman times where people were just raiding. And I think that's why they avoided it. You could raid here and you could, and they had tons of, res the St. Louis area had all kinds of resources. So this, this always had the high populations in the country until that time so it's a real mystery but we don't know for sure because we never found the raided village so it's it's kind of hard uh-huh did I hear somebody propose that there be a, a museum down with that Chesterfield where that oh yes trading, trading site was yeah I would love that but the alderman said no they wanted right. more tax out of it so they right right yeah true? that's very true yeah yeah very true. Yeah, we can't, we, that charnel house I showed you, we didn't get the eastern edge of it because it crossed over into a private developer's land. And we said, can we have, t you know, 10 feet at the most? And he said, no, don't want you to find it because then you then the, well, I can't develop it. And it's like, well, you can develop it. We just want to take this out. Is that you know? around where that Gander Mountain is now or something? Or a Gander? It's um, by Rombox Farm where that used to be. Right. It's right, it's right in the curve where, um, where Osage, or Osage, Olive Street Road turns into Etherton Road. It's right there in that curve is where it's at. And it's still right now a big, they couldn't figure out why when they dug this hole it was filling with water. And I was like, eh, you're getting the groundwater, to, you know. It's, and they couldn't, they were always going to try and drain it. And they never did, I saw. So, 
And it's still, you know, it's a real danger for flooding still there because the river takes a 90 degree turn and every flood that's, I mean, we can see even when this site was abandoned, there was a massive flood episode just before they did it. So it'll happen again almost because that island there almost acts like a, uh, a finger on a hose and it just, uh, you know, makes it even stronger current right there. So it'll probably happen. It'll be devastating, but I hate to see that, but not a good place to build. <laughs> Joe, mm -hmm. Do you know what they're doing with the uh, what the Osage are doing with the Sugarloaf Mound? If anything, they they are going to turn it into a sacred spot. Oh. So they are going to. Uh, I don't know if they they talked about opening up a museum or something nearby, but they didn't want anybody on it, um, and so they they consider it a very sacred spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Are there any books or publications you recommend for further research? Um. One thing you could look at if you want to hear something similar to my talk is we did a report for the city of Wildwood where we, and that's available on their city of Wildwood's website where you can download this stuff and get this information. And it talks about the sites a little bit more in depth than I could today. So that's one book. And then, you know, there's a Missouri Archaeology by Carl Chapman and those kinds of things. They're kind of out, the problem with people that write Missouri Archaeology books in the past is that they concentrate on the arrowheads that are found and the pottery and that's not too much about the people where we try to talk about the people more so that that's certainly there and we've got all kinds of reports on everything we've dug that's certainly available to the public mm -hmm. okay yes uh -huh. are you uh, finding more sites and do you have uh potential sites you'd like to check out. Oh, I'd love to do where the mound group was at in St. Louis City, because it's there. We just finished the NGA facility down there, and uh, everybody's like, oh, there's nothing left there. It's all destroyed. No, we found all kinds of historic materials there. No prehistoric. Unfortunately, it was in a bad spot for prehistoric because it was pretty far from the rivers. But I would have loved to have been a mile to the east because it's there. There's guaranteed the remains of, and that's why they found the French community of St. Louis when they were putting in Poplar Street Bridge. The Modot archaeologists uh, dug down and found the French village, the remains of the French village there. So that did escape the arch grounds where they had torn them all up to build the monument to our past. So um, it's, it's a fortunate that uh, the Modot crew was doing that work. And they're very good. The Modot crew is very good about doing these kinds of things. Oh, if you want to know more about uh, local archaeology where I give talks and a lot of other people give talks. Mound City has flyers up here where you can uh, see it and they have once a month they have talks on all kinds of different things. Fascinating talks. So you can certainly pick up one of those flyers. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.